Time Talks Med here. Let's continue our cranial nerve series. Cranial nerves are 12 pair of nerves that exit the brain and the brainstem. And in this segment, we will talk detailed about the seventh cranial nerve, which is the facial nerve. And we'll do that by first making a quick scheme of the facial nerve pathway. Then we will talk through the functional components and the nuclei of this nerve, since it consists of different fibers. And once we have that overview, we're going to look uh, into the course and distribution by first going through the intracranial course and then the extracranial course. And once we have gone through that, we will talk a little bit about the clinical relevance. All right, so the facial nerve is responsible for providing motor innervation of the facial muscles, as well as taste of the anterior two thirds of the tongue and production of saliva and tears. All right, so here's the scheme. We will quickly run through it and then do it again in a little more detail. Within pons and the upper part of the medulla, we will find the motor nucleus, which sends out motor fibers. We got the superior salivatory nucleus, which sends out fibers to the salivary and the lacrimal glands. Then we got some sensory fibers coming in, synapsing with the spinal nucleus of the trigeminal nerve and the uh, nuclei of the solitary tract. These fibers will all go through the pontomedullary junction, meaning uh, in between pons and the medulla, and they form two fibers. They form the motor root and a smaller sensory root, or commonly referred to as the intermediate nerve. The motor root will travel through the internal acoustic meatus and enter the facial canal. In the facial canal, the facial nerve traverses forward and laterally, uh, forming a bend the genu of the facial nerve, where the geniculate ganglion is located. In the posterior wall of the middle ear, it gives off the nerve to stapedius, supplying the stapedius muscle, and then it continues downwards towards the stylomastoid foramen. The superior salivatory nucleus will give off fibers that is also going to go through the geniculate ganglion without synapsing with it and give off the greater petrosal nerve. On its course towards the foramen lacerum, it merges with the deep petrosal nerve carrying sympathetic fibers to form the nerve of the pterygoid canal. It travels to the pterygopalatine ganglion to provide preganglionic parasympathetic innervation to the lacrimal gland as well as mucous glands of the nasal cavity, maxillary sinus and the palate. Fibers from the superior salivatory nucleus will also branch off and give a nerve called corda tympani. Corda tympani exits the skull by passing through the petrotympanic fissure to enter the infratemporal fossa. Here it terminates in the submandibular ganglion, which then sends off postganglionic fibers to innervate the submandibular and the sublingual salivary glands. Corda tympani consists of two fibers, the general visceral efferent fibers, here in purple, which comes from the superior salivatory nucleus. The other component are SVA fibers, or sensory visceral afferent fibers, is the taste component of the corda tympani. It comes from the taste receptors from the anterior two-third of the tongue, and then travel with the GVE fibers as the corda tympani to synapse with the sensory nuclei in the geniculate ganglion, which then sends fibers towards the uh, nuclei of the solitary tract. A component of the facial nerve also provides sensory innervation around the external acoustic meatus and the retroauricular region, and these fibers are known as general somatic afferent fibers, which uh, travels through the stylomastoid foramen and through the facial canal to synapse with their respective nuclei in the geniculate ganglion, which then sends off fibers towards the spinal nucleus of the trigeminal nerve. Notice though that the geniculate ganglion only has cell bodies for sensory neurons. The other nerves pass through it without synapsing here. Now for the facial muscles. The motor fibers, or special visceral efferent fibers, they're going to travel further through the facial canal and leave through the stylomastoid foramen. It then gives off the posterior auricular nerve, which branches off as the occipital and the auricular segments to innervate the occipital frontalis muscle and the intrinsic muscles of the ear. It will give off a stylohyoid branch and a digastric branch for the respective muscles. The facial nerve 
then continues into the parotid gland, branching off, forming the parotid plexus, which uh, is a plexus of nerves that give off a superior branch and an inferior branch, or a superior division and an inferior division. The superior branch give off the temporal, zygomatic, and the buccal branches, while the inferior branch give off the marginal mandibular and the cervical branch. All of these supply different muscles of the face, and we will go through them in detail once we get here. Alright, so that was the general scheme. Awesome! Now, the facial nerve is one of the most anatomically complex of all the cranial nerves, because it transmits four different types of innovations. And so, I want to start this video off by explaining these four functional components of this nerve before we dive into its pathway. The first type of fibers are the special visceral efferent fibers, or the SVE fibers. They begin from the motor nucleus, at the level of the lower pons, and supply the muscles of facial expression. Then we've got the general visceral efferent fibers, or GVE fibers, which are preganglionic fibers, meaning they arise in the superior salivatory nucleus, then they go to two ganglia. They go to the submandibular ganglia to further innervate the submandibular and the sublingual salivary glands with the postganglionic fibers. The other ganglia it goes to is towards the pterygopalladin ganglia, which sends fibers to innervate the lacrimal gland. Then we got the special visceral afferent fibers, or SVA fibers, and notice they're afferent fibers. So they uh, start in the periphery, or in this case, uh, these fibers start from the taste buds in the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. Then they synapse with neurons in the geniculate ganglion, which sends fibers further uh, towards the brainstem to uh, talk with the upper part of the nucleus of the solitary tract. The last fibers are the general somatic afferent fibers, or GSA fibers. Those fibers come from the skin of the external ear primarily, and then they uh, also synapse with cells in the geniculate ganglion, to then go further and synapse with the spinal nucleus of the trigeminal nerve. So, two efferent fibers leaving the brainstem, and two afferent fibers that come into the brainstem from the geniculate ganglion. Awesome! Now, let's start with the nuclei of the facial nerve. Here we see a side view of the central nervous system. We can see the spinal cord, the medulla oblongata, cerebellum, pons, mesencephalon, and the diencephalon. If we now remove the cerebellum and focus on the brainstem from the posterior side, we will see this. So, we see the mesencephalon, pons, and the medulla. On the posterior side of the brainstem, we can see something called the rhomboid fossa. And the rhomboid fossa is a key location where several cranial nerve nuclei are situated. And because it houses so many nerves and nuclei, they form some external structures, as you can see here. In the middle, we can see the median sulcus that divides the brainstem into two symmetrical halves. On either side, we can see the medial eminence. We can see the medullary stria, which divides pons and the medulla oblongata. And just above the medullary stria, we can find the facial colliculus. And this is what I want us to focus on here, because the facial colliculus is a grossly elevated area on the posterior side of pons that is formed because of the motor fibers of the facial nerve, hence the name, facial colliculus. Here's a cross-section of the distal part of pons. Here we see the abducent nerve nucleus and the facial nucleus. When fibers from the motor nucleus of the facial nerve leaves, they loop around the abducent nerve nucleus like this, before it leaves laterally to the abducent nerve. And this loop that it makes forms the facial colliculus. And here, just for the visuals of it, we got the motor nucleus of the facial nerve, and here's the nucleus of the sixth cranial nerve, the abducent nerve. Fibers from the facial nerve will loop around the abducent nerve nucleus like this, then leave the brainstem on the anterior side between pons and the medulla oblongata, and it will form the facial colliculus, uh, the elevation on the backside of pons. The facial nerve is a bit special again, because it consists of four fibers. Most literature divides this nerve into four fibers, which go to four different nuclei. So four nuclei are considered a part of the facial nerve. The first one is the motor nucleus, which give off SVE fibers. 
we got the superior salivatory nucleus giving off GVE fibers. There's GSA fibers coming into synapse with the spinal nucleus of the trigeminal nerve. And we got the SVA fibers coming in to synapse with the nuclei of the solitary tract. So the actual facial nerve arises from two divisions, a motor root and a smaller sensor root, commonly referred to as the intermediate nerve. So the motor root contains motor fibers, the intermediate nerve contains sensory and parasympathetic fibers of the facial nerve. All right, now let's go through the course and distribution. And I wanna use this image to kinda of illustrate just that. The facial nerve has an intracranial course and an extracranial course. The intracranial course is everything from when the nerve is within the brainstem to the point where it exits the temporal bone. An extracranial course is when it's actually outside of the cranium. I think it's easier to divide it this way. So let's start with the intracranial course. Here again, you see two nerves coming out from the junction between pons and the medulla. We see the motor root of the facial nerve and we see the intermediate nerve. They're both going to penetrate the dura mater and then go through the internal acoustic meatus, as you see here, to enter the facial canal in the petrous part of the temporal bone where they fuse to form the facial uh, nerve proper. The nerve makes a sharp anterior to posterior turn at a point known as the geniculum of the facial nerve. It also enlarges at this point as the geniculate ganglion, which contains the cell bodies of sensory neurons in the facial nerve. As you look at this image, you will notice a large nerve going out from the geniculate ganglion. This one is called the greater petrosal nerve. The greater petrosal nerve consists of parasympathetic GVE fibers, the purple ones I showed you earlier, that come from the superior salivatory nucleus. So they don't synapse with the geniculate ganglion, they just come from the brainstem and run through the ganglion towards the foramen lacerum. On its way towards the foramen lacerum, it merges with the deep petrosal nerve that carries sympathetic fibers to form uh, the nerve of the pterygoid canal. It travels uh, to the pterygopalatine ganglion to provide preganglionic parasympathetic innervation to the lacrimal glands, as well as the uh, mucous glands of the nasal cavity, the maxillary sinus, and the palate. The second intratemporal branch of the facial nerve is the nerve to stapedius muscle, supplying SVE fibers or motor fibers to the uh, stapedius muscle responsible for dampening vibrations and protecting the hearing apparatus when exposed to loud sounds. The final intratemporal branch is the corda tympani. The corda tympani carries gustatory or taste sensory innervation from the front of the tongue and it carries parasympathetic innervation to the submandibular and the sublingual salivary glands. So there are two fibers that make up the corda tympani, GVE fibers and SVA fibers. Corda tympani exits the skull by passing inferiorly through the petrotympanic fissure to enter the infratemporal fossa. Here, corda tympani joins with the lingual branch of the cranial nerve number five, and together these nerves travel anteriorly, deep to the mandible. Along the way, the GVE fibers diverge to terminate in the submandibular ganglion. From here, postganglionic neurons distribute to the submandibular and the sublingual salivary glands. So GVE fibers start from the superior salivatory nucleus in the brainstem and go straight to the submandibular ganglion. In contrast, the SVA taste component of the corda tympani remains with the lingual nerve where it distributes to taste receptors of the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. So it carries sensory information towards the neurons in the geniculate ganglion, which further sends neurons towards the nucleus of the solitary tract. So that was primarily the intracranial course. The facial nerve exits the skull via the stylomastoid foramen, and now it's outside of the skull. So let's go through the extracranial course after it leaves the stylomastoid foramen. Once it exits the stylomastoid foramen, the facial nerve give off the stylohyoid branch and the digastric branch. They carry motor innervation to their respective muscles. 
It also gives off the posterior auricular nerve, which divides into the occipital branch to provide motor innervation to the occipital belly of the occipital frontalis muscle, and the auricular branch to supply mainly the intrinsic auricular muscles. And just for the sake of theory, we also got the general somatic afferent fibers, or GSA fibers, that provide sensory innervation of the skin around the external acoustic meatus and the retroauricular region, which uh, then goes to synapse with the sensory nuclei of the geniculate ganglion, from which sends fibers towards the spinal nucleus of the trigeminal nerve. Alright, so that was those. The facial nerve is then going to continue into the parotid gland, as you see here. And if you fade the parotid gland, you will see that this nerve bifurcates into a superior and an inferior chunk, which forms a network of nerves called the parotid plexus. From here, there are five terminal branches that are going to come off, and they're motor. Uh, they provide motor innervation to facial muscles. The first one is the temporal branch, innervating the facial muscles of the forehead and the temporal region. We get the zygomatic branch that innervate the orbicularis oculi, uh, zygomatic muscles, and the muscles of the nose. There are the buccal branches, innervating the muscles of the cheek and the upper lip. Marginal mandibular branch, innervating the muscles of the chin and the lower lip. Uh, so the depressor labi inferioris, depressor anglioris, and the mentalis muscle. And then we got the cervical branch that innervate the platysma. And in some variations, uh, it also participates in forming the superior cervical ansa. So that was primarily all I had for the course and the distribution. Now, the facial nerve can get damaged at different levels. And with a neurological examination, you'll be able to point out the most probable site of lesions within this pathway. A damage might occur supranuclearly. The upper motor neuron of the facial nerve is located in the primary motor cortex of the frontal lobe. These upper motor neurons will descend ipsilaterally uh, as the cortical bulbar tract uh, via the genu of the internal capsule and reach the facial nucleus in the pontine tegmentum. I haven't gone into this in detail, but the facial nucleus is divided into a dorsal and a ventral region. And so the dorsal region supplies innervation of the muscles of the upper face, whereas neurons in the ventral region innervate muscles of the lower face. The dorsal aspect of the facial nucleus receives input from both the left and the right cerebral hemispheres. And this results in both hemispheres having control over the muscles of the upper face. You with me so far? So if there's a stroke of some sort that affects the cortical bulbar tract, you know, an upper motor neuron lesion, that will cause paralysis of the contralateral middle and the lower part of the face. The muscles of the forehead and eyes are spared because they're innervated by both hemispheres. All right. Now, lesions that involve the facial motor nucleus or lesions to the facial nerve itself result in complete paralysis of all the muscles on the ipsilateral side. And so, since the whole ipsilateral facial muscles are affected, the patient presents with drooping of the mouth and eyelid, as well as flattening of the nasolabial fold. Bell's palsy is a form of facial nerve palsy. It's usually idiopathic cause, meaning uh, we're not entirely sure uh, what causes the damage, but one theory is that it is caused by edema because of a viral infection. Bell's palsy can be distinguished from other causes of facial paralysis by rapid onset of several hours and lack of trauma. What is more is that this kind of facial paralysis is often self-limiting and the patient usually recovers within days to weeks. And uh, patients can benefit from early initiation of steroids as this prevents the progression of edema, diminishing chances of further damage. Alright, so that was everything I had for the facial nerve. Here we see the scheme again of this nerve. It's not detailed, but it will help to gain a general overview of this nerve. So that is this nerve. The next video is going to be about the eighth cranial nerve, the vestibulocochlear nerve. Thank you so much for watching another one of my videos. If you enjoyed, learn something from it, please remember to like, comment your favorite moment, subscribe, turn on those notifications. If you're looking for other ways to support, go ahead and check the link in the description box. Have fun y'all, peace.